Okay, I hope everyone can hear me. So uh, this is a session on objectives and key results, uh, normally known as OKRs. I'm Sana Farooq, and uh, I'm the founder of uh, ELN, the e-learning network. I was incubated in the Nest IO in 2016. And uh, from there, I went to uh, Silicon Valley uh, through the Black Box program. And I was exposed to OKRs for the first time because we spent a day on uh, Google campus. And uh, we uh, had a session with Rick Clow. Uh, he is a person in Google, and he joined. Um, he was part of Google uh, Ventures. He has also been part of YouTube. Um, and at the time when I was speaking to him, he was in YouTube. But I think he's also moved on again to uh, another team. He's been part of uh, various different uh, large companies in Silicon Valley. He was an amazing person, and he told us about OKRs, and basically. I came back uh, from Silicon Valley and implemented uh, this in uh, ELN, and it has been very, very uh, beneficial. So uh, if we just move on to, so uh, I mean, while the session is running, um, I can see from the names that there's some of you who I know um, and some of you who I don't know already. Um, it would re be really great when we get to the implementation stage to kind of know, um, you know, which uh, sectors of startups uh, you're in. So I mean, uh, I want to keep this a bit interactive. So I know that it'll get a bit chaotic if everyone switches their microphones on. But what I would want you to do is if you have any questions or um, you know, uh, if you can just drop a message in the chat with any questions, but also introduce, uh, you know, uh, basic. Okay, can that's that should be fine again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So okay. So I was just gonna say that I want to keep this interactive, and I'd love to know like who is in the audience, uh, what sector your operate uh, your startup operates in, and as you keep thinking of questions uh, during the presentation, don't wait till the end because you'll forget your questions. So if you just type them in the chat. And uh, what I'll do is I'll quickly run through the presentation. And then I do want to keep it interactive and answer your questions and kind of look at how your startup in your industry or in your sector can actually uh, implement this. So um, you know, uh, basically, this session is on objectives and key results. I don't know if my mic was on in the beginning. And I'm Sana Farooq. I'm the founder of ELN, the e-learning network. And I learned uh, OKRs directly from uh, Google's Rick Clow. Um, he has a very good uh, YouTube video as well. Um, I, I'll be giving you guys the link. Uh, to it at the end in the in the group chat as well uh, it is it is very long but that's because he actually takes you through the um, actual uh, OKRs that he had uh, in his first quarter uh, and what he achieved and how the reporting and all the grading works. So it's if you really are serious about implementing OKRs, then that's a really good video to watch. But anyway, so this is uh, the session that we have planned. So I'll quickly run through what are OKRs, the benefits of OKRs versus any other uh, sort of system, and obviously the implementation, how you can go about it. And then we'll have a Q&A at the end. But like I said, uh, as soon as you think of a question, please type it in uh, to your um, uh, type it into the group chat, and I'll be looking at uh, questions later. Okay, what is this? Doing? Right, great. So, what are OKRs? So, basically, OKRs uh, can be defined. Uh, they stand for objectives and key results, and it's a system uh, to manage the achievement of your company's vision. And it's by the whole team. So this definition, I mean, if you actually Google what are OKRs, I'm sure you'll find a lot of definitions and a lot of uh, uh, websites and resources. Um, it's extremely popular. It's being used by Fortune 500 companies as well. And obviously, a lot of people are, uh, there's a whole industry around OKR coaching and training and uh, softwares. So basically, um, this is my definition. Right. So after having used OKRs since uh, 2017 summer, uh, and we are now approaching the summer of 2020. I've been using this system for three years. And it really is an entire management system which helps achieve the company's vision. It helps keep you as a leader, as a founder, focused. And it's by the whole team. That's what I love about it. So originally, OKRs actually is a very old system. It's not new. It was started in 1970s by uh, Intel. Uh, Andy Grove, uh, he was heading Intel at the time. And he came up with the concept. And since the 1970s, throughout the 80s and then the 90s, people who left Intel then introduced this OKR system to the various companies that they moved on to, uh, the most important being um, uh, Door. Uh, and you'll see a lot about him. In fact, you'll see his original uh, slide 
Pocket Deck that he used to pitch OKRs to Google um, in Rick Lau's uh, talk that I'll be sharing the YouTube link uh, later. Um, so why is it suddenly so popular all of a sudden? So basically, it started getting popular um, uh, since 2013, 2014, after Google and Twitter and Airbnb and all of these tech giants uh, started using uh, OKRs. Google has actually been using OKRs since 1999. Um, and at that time, they only had 40 employees. And obviously, now they have something like, I don't know, 30, 40,000 employees all over the world. So yeah, so it works for you as a startup when you have a small team. But uh, Google has shown it also works for you when you are one of the largest companies in the world. right? But just before I start, I just want to backtrack a little bit. And I mean, those of you who know me or who've been on my entrepreneurship course know how much importance I give to the startup's vision. Uh, I'm not going to obviously cover that in this section. But before implementing OKRs, I know a lot of people who are interested in the session on OKRs are usually here because you are having trouble with managing your employees. Uh, perhaps you don't have a system or your KPIs aren't working or uh, you know your startup isn't growing like you expected to or those kind of reasons. The question you have to ask yourself is, have you formalized your startup's vision? Because if you, as a founder, haven't done that, then trust me, OKRs or KPIs or any kind of management system or any folder of HR documents that I give you is not going to help you. So you have to, as a founder, be able to formalize your startup's ultimate goal, your vision, your reality of what the world will be like when you become the next Facebook or Coca-Cola. When everyone in the world is using you, what are you achieving? How are you making people's lives easier? These are questions that you need to actually write down and define. And the second most important thing is, perhaps you know what your vision is. Perhaps you are one, two, three, four, five founders. But have you communicated it to your team? And by team, I literally mean any single person who you can count in the team, whether they're free freelance, whether they are interns, whether they are part time, whether they're full time, and especially the founding team. Every single person in your company should be able to tell you, tell me if I go into your office. It doesn't matter even if they are just an intern and they are there for a month. Literally, they should be able to tell me what the startup's vision is. That is how much you need to communicate it to the team. Because OKRs are generated by the team and they're done by the team, if the team is not um, crystal clear on what your vision is, the OKRs will not be effective, right? So that's all I'm going to say about that for now. And I'm going to focus on implementing the OKRs. But just keep in mind that if you try and implement a system and it doesn't work, go back to the beginning. Make sure that your vision is actually what you want your startup to grow into and that your team knows, right? So basically, OKRs are objectives and key results. So what are objectives? So Objectives are one to three higher level goals. Now, having said that, that's not set in stone. Um, you could have only one objective, or you could have five or seven objectives. But I can tell you that normally, uh, from using OKRs, um, the teams or the quarters where the teams defined OKRs, which were um, more, so like they had maybe four, five, or even six o OKRs. Uh, they ended up not achieving the OKRs. They ended up losing focus. And actually, it causes a lot of demotivation. So I would strongly recommend that every quarter you have one to three high-level goals. Why are they high-level goals? Because they are somehow linked to you achieving your company's vision. It's all connected, right? And the objectives are higher level, so they're qualitative, right? Um, so qualitative means uh, I'll be giving you examples later on in the implementation, in implementation section, but it's kind of like, what is it that you want to do? You are defining what the goal of the company is. Uh, usually, they are quarterly. Um, I mean, in ELN, we keep the OKRs quarterly because we are a very small team. We are actually a team of six uh, still. Uh, but depending on the size of your company, you can also have separate company level yearly OKRs. And then you can have the team OKRs that link to the company level OKRs. and But definitely, the team OKRs need to be reviewed quarterly. Um, throughout the world, wherever OKRs are implemented, they are done in quarterly chunks. And the reporting and the decision making on them happen every quarter. The other important thing about these objectives is that they are decided by the team members. And obviously, they are negotiated or agreed by the leadership. Now, this is a very, very crucial. If you are the founder and you are giving the objectives and key results to your team, uh, that's not OKRs. That's more like KPIs, 
right? So KPIs are where the leadership decides on a vision, they decide on company goals, and then they break down those company goals into like, this is what finance has to do, this is what marketing has to do, this is what operations has to do, this is what production has to do, blah, 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 blah right? And then they give, and that they cascade those KPIs down the entire org chart, right? But OKRs are different because they are defined by each individual team member and they are defined by the teams and they are agreed and negotiated by the leadership. This is why it's important that your vision and your company goal is communicated to your team because initially it will take a lot of effort for you to hold those meetings, do your summit strategy and convey your uh, vision to your team members. But once you do that, literally your teams will be on autopilot and they will be an asset rather than something that distracts you from your work, right? And in ELN, one thing that uh, in the last, since last year I've also implemented is that every team has to have at least one collaborative objective. So this is not something that you will see in like regular other OKR trainings, uh, but in ELN, what does that mean? So that means, for example, marketing has to have at least one objective where somehow they will have to work with um, tech, where they will have to work with training right uh, again the training team will have to have at least one objective where they for example will work with sales uh, so it doesn't matter uh, who it is but at least one objective has to be focused around a cross collaboration and i absolutely love it those are the ones that the teams enjoy the most and actually those are the ones which have the highest achievement rates as well it's very very empowering and very very motivating so the vision of the company dictates what the objectives will be and what every person then automatically has to ask themselves is how can I as an individual or how can my team and then how can the whole startup achieve this vision through these objectives? And you do that every quarter because obviously we know as startup founders, things change very quickly. So for example, even up until like a month ago, Corona wasn't even in our conscious mind. It was something happening in China. We weren't that worried about it. And now it's literally shut a lot of us down. Right. So that's why because startup and I mean, this situation is very fluid for everyone, but more so for startups, things can change in a month or three months. You can be somewhere completely different. And that's why annual KPIs aren't that effective. OK, so what are the key results if those are the objectives? Each objective. So I said one to three objectives and then each objective will have about maybe three, four key results. So what does that mean? So basically the objective is uh the qualitative goal and the key results is how are you going to achieve that objective the key results have to be quantitative quantitative means measurable as in smart so we all know what smart goals are so key results have to be specific measurable achievable reliable and timed right so inherently a key result has to be written in a way that when i see the key result i have to be able to measure out as a percentage or zero to ten uh, whether it was achieved or not. So that in the next quarter, so our quarter in ELN is ending on the 24th of April, we're going to be reporting on our first quarter um, OKRs. So I have to be able to look back at my OKR and say, this was achieved 30%, 70%, 80%, 90%. Um, and usually if you find that you are achieving all your key results 100% of the time, and they're all 100%, that means basically you're not challenging yourself. And that is also something that stops the growth of your company. So are you as a startup, and especially as founders, doing, uh, you know, uh, making objectives and key results that are difficult, that challenge you? Um, the OKRs you make for yourself or your team have to make you uncomfortable. You have to think, oh God, you know, like, I'm not sure how am I going to achieve this in this quarter? I mean, that has to be your kind of reaction of, can I do this, right? But Challenge yourself, make it difficult, but obviously make sure that it is doable, that it is not impossible, right? So keeping in mind the corona situation, and we don't know, to be honest, realistically, where it's going to go, UK being our, our main market, there is like currently four to 500 deaths per day over there, right? So if I set myself a target saying uh, I'm going to uh, acquire a thousand customers in the next quarter, that probably would not be very realistic because people are just really scared over there. Right. So what would be a challenge would be, yes. So where we, uh, you know, last quarter, like, for example, if we uh, achieve 500 customers, then maintaining that 500 despite the situation would be difficult enough, but not impossible. 
So there is a very important distinction. Challenge yourself, but make sure it's doable. So the objectives are what you want to achieve. They are one, two, three. And key results are how will you achieve those objectives, right? And again, have about three or four key results. Uh, there shouldn't be that many key results because remember, you have to report on those metrics at the end of the three months. Um, and especially in the beginning, um, when you're implementing OKRs, it's very, it's, it's much better to actually take it smaller and have less OKRs. Uh, just to get into the flow of the grading and the reporting and all of that, right? Some really good examples. So if you're not sure how to kind of phrase your objectives or key results or how each department should be looking at the OKRs. So these are two websites that uh, I know the owner of OKRs.com, uh, Ben. Uh, he's a, an associate of mine. Uh, there's not a lot of information on his website, but what is there, like the white paper he's written and everything is a very good summary and it's helpful. Um, I'll also be giving you the YouTube link for Rick Clow, but there, there's a lot of videos um, and free information on YouTube. But OKRexamples.co is an excellent website because it actually goes sector by sector, industry by industry, and uh, it gives you examples of objectives and measurable key results. But I mean, you have to be realistic. Make sure that you don't just copy paste off the website and just always just remember, just keep it simple. Look at Rick Clow's YouTube talk. Look at the OKRs that he's showing you from presentations from within Google and see how simply they are phrased. They are not rocket science. They're not something that we cannot understand not being a part of Google. So just keep it simple so that it is achievable. So benefits of OKRs. Um, I hope you guys are writing your questions in the screen because my laptop is a bit slow right now. So I'll check all the questions uh, at the end. Uh, but writing down the questions now will make sure that you don't forget your questions. OK. So uh, benefits of OKRs. So why should you um, you know, uh, use OKRs? I mean, I found them insanely beneficial on multiple levels. And there's a lot of people who agree with me. Even Fortune 500 companies are switching to OKRs. But what are the benefits exactly? So. Firstly, not much time is required, actually, um, especially by management. In fact, um, it reduces the amount of time that you will be uh, that you will spend on managing your employees. I mean, currently, stats show that managers spend about three quarters of their day managing their team uh, or their coworkers, and that's especially true of smaller startups where you don't have different managers for each team. And perhaps as a founder, you're actually managing everyone. Once you implement OKRs, you literally have to uh, give a few hours every month on the review and the checking of the OKRs and the progress and kind of giving your input and feedback. But other than that, there's not that much time and resources required. Uh, flexibility. So definitely, uh, the OKRs should gel with the ultimate goal and the progress of your startup. Um, but it gives you a lot of flexibility, like I mentioned, because you're reviewing the OKRs every three months. Um, uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility rather than having fixed annual goals because in three months the situation can change. You can pivot. Um, you know, a, a co-founder might leave or you might gain a co-founder. I mean, some uh, funding might come in. Uh, whatever happens, it gives you the flexibility after every three months to review what uh, you were able to achieve, what you weren't, why, and uh, you can kind of reanalyze your progress from that point onwards. Most importantly, culture. I mean, when I do my entrepreneurship courses, the most questions I get afterwards are how do we implement culture? I mean, even on our uh, you know community groups and things like that, there's a lot of people who come to me later on and say, do you have like HR policy packs or documents or do you have a sample contract you can give us? I mean, the paperwork and the contracts are crucial. I've had them from day one. Even when I hired my first employee, it was done through a proper paperwork procedure. I'm not saying it's not important, but culture is not something that you can just implement through paperwork. Culture is a whole group of behaviors and norms and beliefs, which any group of people have. So even this call um, has a culture, which is going to be set by me, uh, you know, um, how casual I am and uh, how interactive I make it and, you know, all these kind of things. Every call that you attend will have a different culture. Just like that, every startup has a different culture. Every family has a different culture. And OKRs are a brilliant way of setting positive culture. I mean, when we talk about all those things in culture, about making it safe to fail, uh, about uh, empowering people, about flexibility, about uh, you know openness, communication, transparency, all of that happens with OKRs. So it is a brilliant way to set a good example and set a good culture. 
it's really, really empowering and motivating. Um, it empowers the team because instead of me dictating what they are doing on a daily basis or what they are striving to achieve, the team themselves become motivated to think, how can we benefit ELN? How can we, in our personal capacity and as a team, uh, achieve ELN's vision? And that is incredibly empowering and incredibly motivating for the team. And what happens is when I see the team coming up with ideas that maybe I could not have thought of, and especially as a sole entrepreneur, I need to empower my team to make sure that I don't feel alone. So it's really important for the empowerment and motivation of your team, but also you as a founder. It frees up your time from managing goals and performance reporting and things like that to actually what matters to you as a founder. And uh, you know, it really, really helps uh, the people, your employees to actually jump in with new ideas and be innovative. It motivates them to be more creative. Uh, productivity and focus, so that ties in with people themselves being self-motivated to be more productive. It's hyper-focused because everything is related to the vision. Um, everyone can see each other's OKRs and you know that even I as a, the CEO have to report my OKRs to the entire team. The entire team has to report their OKRs to everyone else as well. You, it becomes transparent and accountable. Immediately, there's so much transparency, transparency and accountability. Nobody's working alone and nobody, it doesn't happen. So like, even if I just asked the other teams to do OKRs and I didn't do it myself, th that's not how OKRs work. The leadership may have their own OKRs. They might be quarterly or annual or longer term, but they are still available in a public space where everyone else's OKRs are available and everyone can see the progress and achievement of each other's OKRs. And that really boosts productivity, it really boosts focus, and it's really great for culture, again, through your transparency and accountability, right? So, I mean, it's really great. So how do you go about implementing it? So, I mean, you know objectives are the higher level goals and then they're broken down into key results. I thought the best way to kind of show you how that is done is just by giving you a few examples. I know there's okrexample.co, the website, but some real life like living examples. So basically what we do is, like I said, uh, it's quarterly reporting and I'll actually show you my own uh, OKR PowerPoint and the way the format that I use and run through it. But just to give you an idea of the cross team OKRs as well. So this is one OKR from my marketing team for the current quarter. Um, and you can see that the OKR is, the objective is optimize the marketing funnel for more MQLs, as in market qualified leads. Uh, and sales are focusing on SQLs, sales qualified leads. Those are terms you can Google. Um, so the key results on how uh, she is going to, uh, my marketing manager is going to achieve these is analyze course-wise profitability and implement the findings in the Easter campaign. Now this has been done. Obviously the Easter campaign is, or, or the early bird is already on and the Easter sale is going to start on the 6th of April. And she knew that the Easter sale would be in the last month of the OKR. So by the time, uh, on the 24th of April, um, she comes to report, she will actually be able to tell me, my marketing manager because of this came to me with my micro uh, uh, economics, micro profitability. And she's the one who came and told me that this is what profitability we have on each course. And then in future sales, we can afford to give this much of a discount on these courses and remain profitable and we can boost sales by doing this, but also raise our profitability. So I was so bogged down in my work because um, we have some development going on that I did not even think about doing this. So she is not only maximizing marketing leads now, she is maximizing ELN's profit. And that came entirely from the way she was thinking because of OKRs. Right. Uh, key result to implement lead capture ideas, video marketing and landing pages. So this is a, a method that she's thought of and launch awareness campaign to increase consumer understanding of vocational learning providers. So those are niche kind of more market studies. Now, the only thing wrong with these OKRs are that the key results are not measurable. Right. So maybe course wise profitability, she can show me a spreadsheet and she can implement the findings in the Easter campaign. And she has already done that. So I can tell she's done that. But implement lead capture ideas. So instead of doing that, she should have written a number. So for example, make sure that we start generating at least one video uh, per week to uh, achieve this, 
right? You have to give a number that can be measured. So at the end of the quarter, when she says we've done two videos or we've done 10 videos, I don't know to what percentage she's been successful, right? So you have to have a number. That's the only thing that's wrong with these OKRs. Alternatively, for sales, so achieve record revenues while increasing profitability, right? So that's a really good OKR that benefits ELN. So the key, how do you achieve record revenues, right? So that's qualitative. But the key results, quarterly revenue increase of 20% in comparison to the same quarter in 2019. So Jan to March 2020 should be 20% better than Jan to March 2019. Ideal. It is specific, measurable, achievable, everything perfect, right? Increase gross profit margin by 15%, again, in comparison to the same quarter in the year before. And on this, he is working with marketing to increase the actual profit margins. And then increase the Middle East sales percentage in total sales, again, by 20%. So before our um, Middle East sales were roughly just under 10%, and he wants to obviously double that and make it 20%. Now, this is a really good example of a sales OKR because, again, it's smart. And I will know if it's been achieved or not or to what percentage it's been. Maybe it's been achieved 50% or 80% or 100% by the time 24th April comes around. Right. Uh, the training team again. So uh, what my training manager wants to do is have internal uh, continuous professional development sessions like an internal ELN training for all staff and have it on a regular basis like an ELN academy for employees. So to do that, he needs to do a training needs analysis. He's given a date. Um, so this says May because these are from last year's. Um, I, these were just better to show you as an example than the ones that he had last quarter. So I'm just using that, so ignore the dates. But the point is that he gave a date. The CPD program drafted and forwarded for approval by 31st May, which he did. And the first CPD session conducted to staff on the 10th of June, again, which he did. So that is a 100% achievement of his objective that he had last summer. right? So this is just to give you an example of the kind of OKRs. Now, in this example, I just wanted to quickly show you. I hope this doesn't hang again. Um, OK, just let me just quickly check in. Wow, so many comments. OK, that's fine. I'll come to your comments in a while. I just wanted to show you the format of my own uh, presentation before we go into the summary. There it is. So to run you roughly through it, so I, I'm not going to put this, like actually go through it, but just to show you. So basically, it'll have the date of the presentation, obviously. And it's 2020, and it's the first quarter. So it's Q1. And this is my presentation. And again, this is publicly available to everyone. This is our summit strategy. Um, this is the ultimate vision of ELN. And I literally go through this with them every three months. This graphic is fixed in this PowerPoint slide. And we discuss it every th three months. This is our org structure currently. I have not put the freelance or part-time staff into this. Uh, but um, yeah, so this can this sometimes changes every three months as well. But that is what it is. There, It is so important to show your team visually where everyone stands within the team. Right. Then I usually have, believe it or not, everyone's working for ELN, but I do give an overview summary of as a company, we have now launched these courses. We are now getting registrations from these countries. And already this is from January, but we have increased our country since then. So when I go to present this on the 24th of April, I will have more new dots on this. And uh, yeah, so we're launching, we, we launched some of these new courses in January. Then I report on my previous goals. So it's a total six slide presentation. And mine is longer than others, because obviously I go through some company level stuff first. But this is literally the previous goals. What have I achieved? What is on track? So mine are quite high level. So they're not as simple. Uh, but some of them, for example, were not achieved. So this partnership is something internally that we knew. Um, and uh, we were aiming to get it through, but it didn't happen. So. Uh, and there were a lot of things that were linked to it. So I it did not go through. So I, as a founder, have to then be accountable to the team. And I had to tell them it didn't go through and why it didn't go through. And then I realign the goals for Q1 2020. 
and basically tell them what my priorities are going to be. So my OKRs usually don't change every quarter because these are company level uh, OKRs. So they roughly change like every six to 12 months. Uh, because obviously the things that I'm working on are higher level and they uh, require me to work on them for a much longer time. Uh, but again, the point is not that that excuses me for presenting. I use the quarterly OKRs to then keep reporting like, okay, fine. So this was originally going to take six months. So technically at three months, I should be halfway there. Uh, so that's why I, I am part of the quarterly meetings and I present every three months, but I do go over the vision, the summit strategy. Uh, and our progress as a company every three months. It's really, really important to know that, right? So that was my example. So I'm just gonna quickly summarize the session uh, before taking your questions. So we went through what are OKRs. OKRs are objectives and key results. Objectives are the higher level uh, qualitative goals. Key results are the measurable, how are you going to achieve the objectives? Um, and if we have one to three objectives per team, then you have about uh, about three key results per objective. They have to be measurable. Remember, they have to be achievable, but they have to be difficult and challenging. If you're not challenging yourself enough, you won't grow. If they are too achievable, you won't grow. Everyone will be in their comfort zone. They won't push themselves. But if they are too difficult, if they become impossible to achieve, then you start seeing demotivation because people get frustrated. And normally, we recommend that you do this quarterly with weekly or monthly update meetings, if you have to. As your team grows, uh, you will have to have more catch-up meetings in between. So use your team huddles. Uh, so if you do a huddle every morning, then once a week, use that huddle to specifically talk about your OKRs and progress. Um, and then as your team kind of grows, you cascade that down in different levels. So the huddles can happen with the managers, not necessarily the founders. And then you start separating yourself. But at least quarterly, you as a founder need to be there with all the managers, all the interns, all the employees, part-time, full-time. And you have to, as a company, present to each other and go through it. Benefits of the OKRs are that they are negotiated. We went over all the culture and the accountability, transparency productivity boost, and they have to come bottom up. You have to listen as a founder to really effectively implement OKRs. They are negotiated. So you listen to the individual who feeds into the team, who feeds into the startup. And that's the way OKRs work, rather than KPIs, which come from top down. And in the implementation, uh, the most important thing that I actually want to tell you is that this is not a performance evaluation tool. Um, I do annual appraisals with my team that is completely different. Um, sometimes whether people are on probation, whether they're probation reviews, whether they're annual appraisals, I mean, HR paperwork and all of that is a completely different uh, topic. Uh, and I want to leave time to answer your questions. But basically, this is not a performance evaluation tool. Why? Because the most important thing is if you turn your OKRs into rather than grading the OKRs and their achievement or not. And if you start using that to grade your employees performance, they will become afraid. They will not think of OKRs which are challenging and which will actually grow your team. They will think of OKRs which are easy to achieve. They will be scared and they will not be empowered or motivated. If you bring their performance evaluation into OKRs, and if you mention their grades or their productivity on OKRs in their appraisal, your OKRs will not work, basically. It completely undermines the entire cultural and team communication aspect of it. So basically, I'm going to copy paste this link um, into the team chat so you guys can uh, Watch it later. Um, this is the guy's name, Rick Clow, and he was part of Google Ventures and YouTube when I met him and he held the session with us. But he has a very nice, uh, it's an hour long uh, call on um, uh, or YouTube, uh, but it's definitely um, worth watching. OK. Sorry. OK, I'm just going to open up your questions now. OK, if you haven't typed in any questions yet, so please um, add in any questions that you have.
Okay, so Sabika asked, um, are OKRs also used by companies to evaluate performances? And uh, yeah, I just uh, answered this. Um, uh, so definitely don't use it for evaluation performance, unless obviously uh, the only time I would say that it would come in is if somebody is consistently failing at their OKRs. So there was a period last year when for three quarters consecutively, the uh, training team did not meet their OKRs, like even one of their objectives. And that should tell you that there's something wrong with the team or that there's something you are doing wrong as a founder or that the OKRs are not being set effectively and instead of again not using it as a as a performance evaluation for the training manager or the training team itself but you do need to then as a founder go into the team have a meeting and say guys what's wrong and then it turned out that there were a lot of underlying issues for example they, they the workload was too much they couldn't concentrate on the extra okr work it was there was a problem with the way they were developing their okrs and setting their okrs and there was a genuine shortage of resources that they needed to actually achieve the targets that they wanted including time so then i was able to sort out those issues and then after those three quarters then obviously um they came back and um they're, they're on track now, so it's brilliant. So what's a good OKR for film and trade? So yeah, so I mean, uh, as you see in uh, the OKR uh, talk that Rick Lau, uh, I'm going to paste the link here. Uh, but honestly, really, really watch it because uh, he shows you how to even grade it. And uh, if you are getting 10 out of 10 or 100%, then like you said, they aren't challenging enough. But normally, if you are achieving 70 to 80 percent, that is a good score. So if most of your teams and also remember, so if one objective has like three key results, you may achieve one key result like 100 percent, just like my marketing one I showed you. So the first one, she has already achieved it. She has already sent me the reports because the sale is already designed and implementing. So that key result is 100 percent. Right. But then the next one, she never gave a measurable statistic against. So in my mind, that means that we need to be putting out at least two to three videos per week. Now, if she has not done that over the last quarter, in my mind, obviously, her achievement rate in that is going to be very low. And I'm expecting it to be very low because uh, according to my expectation, it is going to be very low because I know for a fact that many videos are not going out on our social media. So um, another question. So yeah, so one is 100%. Let's say one is 10% and the next is 50%. What you will do is for that objective, uh, your average will be those three. So if you are averaging about 70 to 80%, it doesn't matter individually what key results are happening. But if you uh, overall in your objectives, if you are um, achieving 70 to 80%, uh, then that should be good enough. Uh, but you as a founder still need to kind of look at the presentations and see why it's not being achieved. Um, and there still has to be some amount of common sense for you as a founder to be involved in, uh, you know, like have that. Uh, can part-time employees be a part of this? Like I said, um, I'm a strong believer in even interns being a part of your vision and summit strategy. Um, and they definitely are part of your um OKRs, even if it's just an intern who is with you for only one month, they are part of the OKRs. They will contribute for that one month, whatever they can to that team's OKRs. Uh, another question, uh, how can we implement OKRs for a team of three? Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, we are still basically a team of about six full time. And uh, some of our teams are only one person per team. Uh, so like the marketing is uh, one person and she hires freelancers and interns when she needs it and then but on an ongoing basis regularly she is just one person in a team so even then it's possible because even every single individual should have their objectives and key results remember OKRs are going from an individual to a team to the startup right it's not coming down from the top so when it's bottom up even if there's one person you can have OKRs. Even if there are three people, let's say there are the three co-founders, the problem that in that question, uh, Khurram, is probably that you guys haven't defined your, um, uh, your vision and you haven't kind of separated what each of the three of you would be doing, right? Um, that's really important. So like I said right at the beginning, uh, you have to define your vision and the lines of responsibility have to be very clear. So even if it's one person per team, but you have to do the groundwork first 
Otherwise, the OKRs, in fact, no other system will work. Um, and that causes a lot of frustration overlapping. And also that, especially if it's three founders, that causes a lot of sense of I'm doing something that's more important. That person isn't doing that much. When you have OKRs and everyone can see OKRs and agree on those OKRs and see the progress against those OKRs, that relieves a lot of uh, stress and frustration. Um, is it okay for an employee to suggest this to the team lead without them feeling insecure of their position? Well, I mean, uh, I, I would say that if the team lead feels insecure because one of their uh, employees has come to them with a suggestion, uh, especially some a suggestion for the OKRs or about implementing OKRs, then they probably shouldn't be a team lead. Uh, being a team lead does not mean, uh, again, that's a very top-down uh, mindset and somebody who gets threatened by an employee suggesting something new is not somebody who has the mindset for OKRs anyway. Um, so yeah, uh, I mean, that should not happen. A team lead should be the one, just like I said, in OKRs, you as a founder are the people who are listening the most to every single presentation and what's going on, why they are failing, why they are achieving what they're achieving, what are they setting, do you agree? So it's a negotiation, it has to be a two-way thing. So definitely, I think any employee, whether part-time, full-time, freelance, whatever, can uh, make any suggestions to their team, because again, it, go it starts from the individual, OKR start from the individual, they help uh, define what the team can achieve and will achieve, and that helps define what the startup will achieve. The only thing that's required top down, and in fact, I did that as a group activity as well. It was not top down, but our entire summit strategy was a group effort. So that chart that I showed you guys, uh, which was part of my presentation for ELN's vision and summit strategy was done by the four employees who I had at that time, two of which aren't even with ELN anymore. It doesn't matter if they leave you. Um, you have to have a culture where you, as, where you, you know, kind of convey the vision and the goal. And then the team buys into that dream. And then you empower them to think with their minds and create something that you could not have created on your own. So OKRs is a way of doing that. Summit strategy is a way of doing that. So I hope that's answered your question. You should definitely make the suggestion. And the team lead should definitely not feel insecure. In fact, they should be happy that their team members are thinking innovatively and creatively. Um, I think that's all the questions. Oh, no. Uh, OK. How do you ensure that your employees contribute to OKRs, considering that it's not a part of their appraisal evaluation exercise? So every quarter, like I showed you in the, I don't know if you were there when I was showing you my presentation. Um, in my presentation, whenever every team presents their OKRs, they have to report back on the previous quarters. And obviously, every, there has to be a place. So we have a Dropbox folder where date-wise, uh, we have folders. And everyone's pre previous and current OKRs are visible to everyone. Um, and it can be that simple. So Dropbox folders, um, Excel, Google Sheets, whatever it is that you want to use, uh, you know, you make a wiki page, make a Google site, uh, where visibility is everything. So when someone is performing or not performing or achieving or not achieving the OKRs, um, it's visible to everyone, right? And within the OKRs, they have to be structured in a way that um, it's, it's the team who decides what they're going to do, right? So every single person then has to contribute automatically when the team decides what to do. If someone from the team is not pulling their weight, you will find that instead of, um, as a founder, you having to spot every single person who's not doing their job, the team will control that. And very quickly, a person who is not doing their job or who is not pulling their weight, um, or who is trying to slack off, you know, these are not those team projects in school, uh, you know, that three, there were always three slackers on the team and there, there were three over efficient people who would do all the work and the three slackers would turn up on the day of the presentation to take all the credit. That's not how it's going to happen because you need to create enough open communication in your team uh, for those people to actually come to you, the team will decide this person is not capable of doing this. And then you use your appraisal and prob probation and all of that system to actually talk to that person. And again, that's a negotiation. And you say, well, you know, what have you done to um, help your team with their OKRs? This is what I have from the team. 
give them a chance to defend themselves. Sometimes some people work in a way that is not visible to others, but they might be doing work. So again, it's always um, uh, you know a question and it's two way. It's a negotiation, sorry. It's a discussion, it's a negotiation, and it's two-way. And uh, find out what's going on. But sometimes, unfortunately, there will be people who are not pulling their weight, who are not doing the work. And what I always say is you have to uh, fire um, uh, very quickly. You have to uh, fire anyone who's not pulling their weight and is being toxic to the culture of your company and who's not fitting in in the behavior patterns uh, that you want to implement. Just get rid of them. Just no matter how brilliant or talented they are, just get rid of them. Uh, that's a really good one, Jahan. Um, in university projects or teams, I would say because OKRs are quarterly, um, then the project obviously would have to be at least three months long uh, to implement OKRs. But I think, uh, especially having used OKRs for like the last three years, OKRs is just becomes a way of operating. So our company just operates the way it does because of OKRs. It just becomes how we communicate and how we see each other and how we work with each other. Um, it just becomes a system of interaction and communication. So yeah, so definitely for a university project, even if they're university students, they can have objectives and key results. Um, they have the ultimate goal, which is whatever the project should be. And then they can split their duties and define what each individual is going to do. Um, or even within the team, if they have, for example, groups of people doing different jobs, each of them can have their own OKRs. And it can be very simple. So maybe one team will have only one OKR, one objective, and maybe three key results. So um, yeah, it can work uh, for very few people on a very small project, or it can work for a startup. It can work for a Fortune 500 company. So I think it's a very flexible system. Uh, any further questions? Sabika, how are we on time? Yeah, yeah, we are doing great. I think 53 minutes or so into the session, 50 minutes or so. OK. So okay. We can wrap up, I guess. Yeah. OK, brilliant. Thank you, Khuram. And I hope I uh, answered your question. Uh, OK, Sabika, I think there's a question on. Um, uh, is I think this is recorded and uh, Anis, I think it's on uh, social media and it's live. But uh, thank you very much. I'm really glad you guys found it uh, helpful. And um, uh, 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 just scroll up in the chat and um, definitely look up the link that I gave you. It's it's an hour and twenty minutes. You can kind of zoom through it very quickly. Uh, but as a founder, especially, it's, it is going to be worth your time uh, just to figure out how to implement that and with very specific examples and what to do and what not to do in a lot of detail. And uh, I really, really hope it works well for you. And uh, connect with me on social media. And if you have any questions, you can always message. And I can. Uh, I like helping uh, different startups. So if there's Sana, can you can also uh, leave your email in the chat if if, if anyone oh if anyone okay sure wants to contact you. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. We have a session tomorrow on remote working. Join us there as well. Details on our social media pages. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I'll copy paste the link again. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And thank you for all the very uh, relevant questions. And I'm glad you all liked it. Thank you.